Welcome to a Legendarium special in which we will seek to answer a simple question. How did medieval poachers ply their trade? After the Norman conquest of 1066, William the Conqueror snatched up vast tracts of land, even entire towns, and declared them to be part of the new forest. That does not mean he planted lots of trees, but he placed the land under forest law, turning it into the royal family's private hunting park. Barons and earls sometimes received hereditary hunting privileges in royal woods, and knights could become hereditary wardens of the new forest. Forest law aimed to preserve as much of the animal life as possible for royal hunts, or for those given permission by the king to hunt. That also meant royal wardens, who enforced forest law, did so with draconian punishments. People caught with a bow and arrow in the new forest, presumably for hunting deer, would have the two fingers they used to draw a bowstring chopped off. Some said that William the Conqueror loved stags as much as his children, and his heirs seemed to feel the same way. King Henry I put poaching on the same level as murder, while Richard the Lionheart ordered that poachers have their eyes and testicles removed. There are also some stories about wicked nobles who sewed poachers into deerskins and then set their hunting hounds upon them. On that note, dogs too large to pass through a small hoop would have their two left foreclaws cut off to keep them from serving as hunting hounds. Peasant farmers who lived in the new forest could not even fence off their land against the king's deer. If a herd of deer came into their fields and ate their crop, then they would just have to go hungry that winter. In short, deer enjoyed more rights and privileges than people. That is likely one of the reasons why the Robin Hood stories became so popular. They recalled a time before the Norman Conquest when people could use the forests as they pleased. Yet what sort of person dared to break forest law? Victorian literature and classic films have given us a particular image of medieval poachers. We tend to imagine desperate peasants driven into the forest to hunt deer to relieve hunger caused by high taxes. In truth, poaching the king's deer would not be an option for most peasants. A deer hunt could take hours, if not days, and required extensive skills in tracking and camouflage that most peasants simply did not have time to develop. Indeed, most professional medieval outlaws tended not to be peasants, but nobles who did not stand to inherit an estate nor had nothing better to do in peacetime. If they lacked prospects, they simply became outlaws. Such outlaw nobles, who probably grew up learning how to hunt, could easily disappear into a royal forest and poach to their heart's content. For hunting stags or deer, they used packs of dogs and bows and arrows to stay out of range of stags' horns. When hunting boar, poachers used very long spears to keep away from the tusks. When hunting game birds, poachers used packs of dogs to set the geese or pheasants flying and then picked them out of the air with a bow and arrow. Yet that does not mean they only poached big game. The Normans also brought rabbits called conies to England. The king's favorites could have the right to free warren, the right to hunt small game like rabbits and hares. Of course, monasteries and lords bred most rabbit warrens for their fur, much prized for luxury clothes, so they would rather not have them hunted and employed warreners to protect the warrens. The 14th century became a time of social mobility, and rabbit fur became popular among the newly rich because it resembled the more valuable ermine worn by the nobles. However, when some rabbits escaped and bred in the wild, they became a pest. Peasants took to hunting them anyway, since they could do it far more easily than with deer, it kept their crops safe, and it was a lot harder for warreners to keep track of rabbits than for wardens to keep track of deer. Usually, peasants captured ferrets and put muzzles on them to keep them from eating the rabbits. They then sent them into the warrens to chase the rabbits out, and the hunters held out nets to catch them. In some counties, professional poachers hired rented ferrets from peasants for this purpose. If you couldn't find a ferret, you could always use a medieval smoke bomb made from yellow arsenic, sulfur, and myrrh.
The poacher set the bomb alight and threw it into the burrow, which sent the rabbits running into the nuts. Poaching became so lucrative that criminal gangs, usually made up of high-born men, got into the action. Since the rabbit warrants lay far from the manor, that could make the lives of warreners exciting and short. And the age of poaching continued well past the Middle Ages. The last man to hang for poaching would be Charles Smith, who lived on the estate of future Prime Minister Lord Palmerston. He used a local fair with its great noise as a cover for taking his musket into the Viscount's forest. Unfortunately, it happened to be patrolled by an especially determined gamekeeper, and Smith shot him by accident. After a year on the run, Charles Smith hung in 1822, and only a year later, Parliament took poaching off the capital offences list. That wraps things up for this episode of The Legendarium. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, press like. If you want to see more, press subscribe. And if you've got anything to say, let me know in the comments section. Thanks again for joining me, and I hope that you have a great rest of the day.